I'm Pat Tully of the Ketchikan Public Library, and this is Reading Aloud. This week I'm going to read a story by Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, Poe is best known as a writer of macabre tales of horror and suspense, but in his day he wrote in a variety of styles. So the story I'm reading today is a funny story about con men, or diddlers, as they were known. It was published in the Philadelphia Saturday Courier on October 14th, 1843. So here we go. Diddling, considered as one of the exact sciences. Since the world began, there have been two Jeremys. The one wrote a Jeremiad about usury and was called Jeremy Bentham. He has been much admired by Mr. John Neal and was a great man in a small way. The other gave name to the most important of the exact sciences and was a great man in a great way. I may say, indeed, in the very greatest of ways. Diddling, or the abstract idea conveyed by the ver verb to diddle, is sufficiently well understood. Yet the fact, the deed, the thing diddling, is somewhat difficult to define. We may get, however, at a tolerably distinct conception of the matter in hand by defining not the thing diddling in itself, but man as an animal that diddles. Had Plato but hit upon this, he would have been spared the affront of the picked chicken. Very pertinently, it was demanded of Plato why a picked chicken, which was clearly a biped without feathers, was not, according to his own definition, a man. But I am not to be bothered by any similar query. Man is an animal that diddles, and there is no animal that diddles but man. It will take an entire hen coop of picked chickens to get over that. What constitutes the essence, the nair, the principle of diddling is, in fact, peculiar to the class of creatures that wear coats and pantaloons. A crow thieves, a fox cheats, a weasel outwits, a man diddles. To diddle is his destiny. Man was made to mourn, says the poet, but not so, he was made to diddle. This is his aim, his object, his end. And for this reason, when a man's diddled, we say he's done. Diddling, rightly considered, is a compound of which the ingredients are minuteness, interest, perseverance, ingenuity, audacity, nonchalance, originality, impertinence, and grin. Minuteness. Your diddler is minute. His operations are upon a small scale. His business is retail for cash or approved paper at sight. Should he ever be tempted into magnificent speculation, he then at once loses his distinctive features and becomes what we term financier. The, this latter word conveys the diddling idea in every respect except that of magnitude. A diddler may thus be regarded as a banker in petto, a financial operation, as a diddle in brognagan. The one is to the other as Homer is to Flaccus, as a mastodon to a mouse, as the tail of a comet to that of a pig. Interest. Your diddler is guided by self-interest. He scorns to diddle for the mere sake of the diddle. He has an object in view, his pocket and yours. He regards always the main chance. He looks to number one. You are number two and must look to yourself. Perseverance. Your diddler perseveres. He is not readily discouraged. Should even the banks break, he cares nothing about it. He steadily pursues his end, and ut canis a corio nunquam absteribitur unco. So he never lets go of his game. Ingenuity. Your diddler is ingenious. He has constructiveness large. He understands plot. He invents and circumvents. Were he not Alexander, he would be Diogenes. Were he not a diddler, he would be a maker of patent rat traps or an angler for trout. Audacity. 
Your diddler is audacious. He is a bold man. He carries the war into Africa. He conquers all by assault. He would not fear the daggers of Frey Heron. With a little more prudence, Dick Turpin would have been made a good diddler. With a trifle less blarney, Daniel O'Connell. With a pound or two more brains, Charles the Twelfth. Nonchalance. Your diddler is nonchalant. He is not at all nervous. He never had any nerves. He never is seduced into a flurry. He is never put out, unless put out of doors. He is cool, cool as a cucumber. He is calm, calm as a smile from Lady Bury. He is easy, easy as an old glove or the damsels of ancient Baiae. Originality. Your diddler is original, conscientiously so. His thoughts are his own. He would scorn to employ those of another. A stale trick is his aversion. He would return a purse, I am sure, upon discovering that he had obtained it by an unoriginal diddle. Impertinence. Your diddler is impertinent. He swaggers. He sets his arms akimbo. He thrusts his hand in his trousers pockets. He sneers in your face. He treads on your corns. He eats your dinner. He drinks your wine. He borrows your money. He pulls your nose. He kicks your poodle and he kisses your wife. Grin. Your true diddler winds up all with a grin, but this nobody sees but himself. He grins when his daily work is done, when his allotted labors are accomplished, at night in his own closet, and all together for his own private entertainment. He goes home, he locks his door, he divests himself of his clothes, he puts out the candle, he gets into bed, he places his head upon the pillow, all this done, and your diddler grins. This is no hypothesis. It is a matter of course. I reason a priori, and a diddle would be no diddle without a grin. The origin of the diddle is referable to the infancy of the human race. Perhaps the first diddler was Adam. At all events, we can trace the science back to a very remote period of antiquity. The moderns, however, have brought it to a perfection never dreamed of by our thick-headed progenitors. Without pausing to speak of the old saws, therefore, I shall content myself with a compendious account of some of the more modern instances. A very good diddle is this. A housekeeper in want of a sofa, for instance, is seen to go in and out of several cabinet warehouses. At length, she arrives at one offering an excellent variety. She is accosted and invited to enter by a polite and voluble individual at the door. She finds a sofa well adapted to her views, and upon acquire, inquiring the price, she is surprised and delighted to hear a sum named at least 20% lower than her expectations. She hastens to make the purchase, gets a bill and receipt, leaves her address with the request that the article be sent home as speedily as possible, and retires amid a profusion of bows from the shopkeeper. The night arrives and no sofa. A servant is sent to make inquiry about the delay. The whole transaction is denied. No sofa has been sold, no money received, except by the diddler, who played shopkeeper for the nonce. Our cabinet warehouses are left entirely unattended and thus afford every facility for a trick of this kind. Visitors enter, look at furniture, and depart unheeded and unseen. Should anyone wish to purchase, or inquire the price of an article, a bell is at hand, and this is considered amply sufficient. Again, a quite a respectable diddle is this. A well-dressed individual enters a shop, makes a purchase to the value of a dollar, finds much to his vexation that he has left his pocketbook in another coat pocket, and so says the shopkeeper, my dear sir, never mind, just oblige me, will you, by sending the bundle home? But stay, I really believe that I have nothing less than a $5 bill, even there. However, you can send $4 in change with the bundle, you know. Very good, sir, replies the shopkeeper, who entertains at once a lofty opinion of the high-mindedness of his customer. I know, fellows, he says to himself, 
who would just have put the goods under their arm and walked off with a promise to call and pay the dollar as they came by this afternoon. A boy is sent with the parcel and change. On the route, quite accidentally, he is met by the purchaser, who exclaims, Ah, this is my bundle, I see. I thought you had been home with it long ago. Well, go on. My wife, Mrs. Trotter, will give you the five dollars. I left instructions with her to that effect. The change you might as well give to me. I will want some silver for the post office. Very good. One, two. Is this a good quarter? Three, four. Quite right. Say to Mrs. Trotter that you met me, and be sure now and do not loiter along the way. The boy doesn't loiter at all, but he is a very long time in getting back from his errand, for no lady of the precise name of Mrs. Trotter is to be discovered. He consoles himself, however, that he has not been such a fool as to leave the goods without the money, and re-entering his shop with a self-satisfied air, feels sensibly hurt and indignant when his master asks him what has become of the change. A very simple diddle indeed is this. The captain of a ship, which is about to sail, is presented by an official looking person with an unusually moderate bill of city charges. Glad to get off so easily, and confused by a hundred duties pressing upon him all at once, he discharges the claim forthwith. In about 15 minutes, another and less reasonable bill is handed him by one who soon makes it evident that the first collector was a diddler in the original collection, a diddle. And here, too, is a somewhat similar thing. A steamboat is casting loose from the wharf. A traveler, portmanteau in hand, is discovered running toward the wharf at full speed. Suddenly, he makes a dead halt, stoops, and picks up something from the ground in a very agitated manner. It is a pocketbook, and, has any gentleman lost a pocketbook, he cries? No one can say that he has exactly lost a pocketbook, but a great excitement ensues when the Trevor Trows is found to be of value. The boat, however, must not be detained. Time and tide wait for no man, says the captain. For God's sake, say only a few minutes, says the finder of the book. The true claimant will presently appear. Can't wait, replies the man in authority. Cast off there, do you hear? What am I to do, says the finder in great tribulation. I am about to leave the country for some years, and I cannot conscientiously retain this large amount in my possession. I beg your pardon, sir, here he addresses a gentleman on shore, but you have the air of an honest man. Will you confer upon me the favor of taking charge of this pocketbook? I know I can trust you, and of advertising it. The notes you see amount to a very considerable sum. The owner will, no doubt, insist upon rewarding you for your trouble. Me? Oh, you. It was you who found the book. Well, if you must have it so, I will take a small reward, just to satisfy your scruples. Let me see why these notes are all hundreds. Bless my soul, a hundred is too much to take. Fifty would be quite enough, I'm sure. Cast off there, says the captain. But then I have no change for a hundred, and upon the whole you had better. Cast off there, says the captain. Never mind, cries the gentleman on shore, who has been examining his own pocketbook for the last minute or so. Never mind. I can fix it. Here's a 50 on the Bank of North America. Throw the book. And the over-conscientious finder takes the 50 with marked reluctance and throws the gentleman the book, as desired, while the steamboat fumes and fizzes on her way. And about half an hour after her departure, the large amount is seen to be counterfeit presentment and the whole thing a capital diddle. A bold diddle is this. A camp meeting or something similar is to be held at a certain spot which is accessible only by means of a free bridge. A diddler stations himself upon this bridge, respectfully informs all passers by of the new county law, which establishes a toll of one cent per, for foot passengers, two for horses and donkeys, and so forth and so forth. Some grumble, but all submit, and the diddler goes home a wealthier man by some fifty or sixty dollars well earned. This taking a toll from a great crowd of people is an excessively troublesome thing. A neat diddle is this. A friend holds one of the diddler's promises to pay, filled up and signed in due form, upon the ordinary blanks printed in red ink. The diddler purchases one or two dozen of these blanks, and every day dips one of them in his soup, makes his dog jump for it, 
and finally gives it to him as a bun bouche. The note arriving at maturity, the diddler with the diddler's dog calls upon the friend and the promise to pay is made the topic of discussion. The friend produces it from his escritoire and is in the act of reaching it to the diddler when up jumps the diddler's dog and devours it forthwith. The diddler is not only surprised but vexed and incensed at the absurd behavior of his dog and expresses his entire readiness to cancel the obligation at any moment when the evidence of the obligation shall be forthcoming. A very mean diddle is this. A lady is insulted in the street by a diddler's accomplice. The diddler himself flies to her assistance and, giving his friends a comfortable thrashing, insists upon attending the lady to her own door. He bows with his hand upon his heart and most respectfully bids her adieu. She entreats him as her deliverer to walk in and be introduced to her big brother and her papa. With a sigh, he declines to do so. Is there no way then, sir, she murmurs, in which I may be permitted to testify my gratitude? Why, yes, madam, there is. Would you be kind enough to lend me a couple of shillings? In the first excitement of the moment, the lady decides upon fainting outright. Upon second thought, however, she opens her purse, strings, and delivers the specie. Now this, I say, is a diddle minute, for one entire moiety of the sum borrowed has to be paid to the gentleman who had the trouble of performing the insult, and who then had to stand still and be thrashed for performing it. Rather a small, but still a scientific diddle is this. The diddler approaches the bar or tavern and demands a couple of twists of tobacco. These are handed to him when, having slightly examined them, he says, I don't much like this tobacco. Here, take it back and give me a glass of brandy and water in its place. The brandy and water is furnished and imbibed and the diddler makes his way to the door. But the voice of the tavern keeper arrests him. I believe, sir, you have forgotten to pay for your brandy and water. Pay for my brandy and water? Didn't I give you the tobacco for the brandy and water? What more would you have? But sir, if you please, I don't remember that you paid me for the tobacco. What do you mean by that, you scoundrel? Didn't I give you back your tobacco? Isn't that your tobacco lying there? You expect me to pay for what I did not take? But sir, says the publican, now at rather a loss of what to say, but sir, but me no but sir, interrupts the diddler, apparently in very high dudgeon, and slamming the door after him, he makes his escape. But me no but sir, and none of your tricks upon travelers. Here again is a very clever diddle, of which the simplicity is not its least recommendation. A purse or pocketbook being really lost, the loser inserts in one of the daily papers of a large city a fully descriptive ad advertisement. Whereupon our diddler copies the facts of this advertisement with a change of heading of general phraseology and address. The original, for instance, is long and verbose and is headed a pocketbook lost and requires the treasure when found to be left at number one Tom Street. The copy is brief and being headed with lost only, indicates number two Dick or number three Harry Street as the locality at which the owner may be seen. Moreover, it is inserted in at least five or six of the daily papers of the day, while in point of time, it makes its appearance in only a few hours after the original. Should it be read by the loser of the purse, he would hardly suspect it to have any reference to his own misfortune. But of course, the chances are five or six to one that the finder will repair to the address given by the diddler rather than to that pointed out by the rightful proprietor. The former pays the reward, pockets the treasure, and decamps. Quite an analogous diddle is this. A lady of ton has dropped for somewhere in the street a diamond ring of very unusual value. For its recovery, she offers some 40 or $50 reward giving in her advertisement a very minute description of the gem and of its settings and declaring that on its restoration at number so-and-so in such and such an avenue, their reward would be paid in stanter without a single question being asked. During the lady's absence from home, a day or two afterwards, a ring is heard at the door of number so-and-so in such and such an avenue. A servant appears, the lady of the house is asked for and declared to be out, at which astounding information the visitor expresses the most poignant regret. 
His business is of importance and concerns the lady herself. In fact, he had the good fortune to find her diamond ring. But perhaps it would be as well that he should call again. By no means, says the servant, and by no means, says the lady's sister and the lady's sister-in-law, who are summoned forthwith. The ring is clamorously identified, the reward is paid, and the finder nearly thrust out of doors. The lady returns and expresses some little dissatisfaction with her sister and sister-in-law because they happen to have paid 40 or $50 for a facsimile of her diamond ring, a facsimile made out of real pinchback and unquestionable paste. But as there's really no end to diddling, so there would be none to this essay, were I even to hint at half the variations or inflections or of which this science is susceptible. I must bring this paper for perforce to a conclusion, and this I cannot do better than by a summary notice of a very decent but rather elaborate diddle, of which our own city was made the theater not very long ago, and which was subsequently repeated with success in other still more verdant localities in the Union. A middle-aged gentleman arrives in town from parts unknown. He is remarkably precise, cautious, staid and deliberate in his demeanor. His dress is scrupulously neat, but plain, unostentatious. He wears a white cravat, an ample waistcoat, made with an eye to comfort alone, thick-soled, cozy-looking shoes, and pantaloons without straps. He has the whole air, in fact, of your well-to-do, sober-sighted, exact, and respectable man of business. Par excellence, one of those stern and outwardly hard, internally soft sort of people that we see in the crack-high comedies. Fellows whose words are so many bonds and who are noted for giving away guineas in charity with one hand while, in the way of mere bargain, they exact the uttermost fraction of a farthing with the other. He makes much ado before he can get suited with a boarding house. He dislikes children. He has been accustomed to quiet. His habits are methodical, and then he would prefer getting into a private and respectable small family, piously inclined. Terms, however, are no object. Only he must insist upon settling his bill on the first of every month. It is now the second. And begs his landlady, when he finally obtains one to his mind, not on any account to forget his instructions upon this point, but to send in a bill and receipt precisely at 10 o'clock on the first day of every month and under no circumstances to put it off to the second. These arrangements made, our man of business rents an office in a reputable rather than a fashionable quarter of the town. There is nothing he more despises than pretense. Where there is much show, he says, there is seldom anything very solid behind, an observation which so profoundly impresses his landlady's fancy that she makes a pencil memorandum of it forthwith in her great family Bible on the broad margin of the Proverbs of Solomon. The next step is to advertise after some such fashion as this in the principal business six pennies of the city. The pennies are eschewed as not respectable and as demanding payment for all advertisements in advance. Our man of business holds it as a point of his faith that work should never be paid for until done. Wanted. The advertisers, being about to commence extensive business operations in this city, will require the services of three or four intelligent and competent clerks, to whom a liberal salary will be paid. The very best recommendations, not so much for capacity as for integrity, will be expected. Indeed, as the duties to be performed involve high responsibility and large amounts of money must necessarily pass through the hands of those engaged, it is deemed advisable to demand a deposit of $50 from each clerk employed. No person need apply, therefore, who is not prepared to leave this sum in the possession of the advertisers and who cannot furnish the most satisfactory testimonials of morality. Young gentlemen piously inclined will be preferred. Application should be made between the hours of 10 and 11 a.m. and 4 and 5 p.m. of Messieurs. Boggs, Hogs, Logs, Frogs, and Company, number 110 Dog Street. By the 31st day of the month, this advertisement has brought to the office of Messrs. Boggs, Hogs, Logs, Frogs, and Company some 15 or 20 young gentlemen piously inclined. But our man of business is in no hurry to conclude a contract with any, 
No man of business is ever precipitate. And it is not until the most rigid catechism in respect to the piety of each young gentleman's inclination that his services are engaged and his $50 receded for, just by way of proper precaution on the part of the respectable firm of Boggs, Hogs, Logs, Frogs, and Company. On the morning of the first day of the next month, the landlady does not present her bill according to promise, a piece of neglect for which the comfortable head of the house ending in Oggs would no doubt have chided her severely could he have been prevailed upon to remain in town a day or two for that purpose. As it is, the constables have had a sad time of it, running hither and thither, and all they can do is declare the man of business most emphatically a hen knee high, by which some persons imagine them to imply that he is N-E-I, by which again the very classical phrase non est inventus is supposed to be understood. In the meantime, the young gentlemen, one and all, are somewhat less piously inclined than before, while the lady purchases a shilling's worth of the India ru Indian rubber and very carefully obliterates the pencil memorandum that some fool has made in her great family Bible on the broad margin of the Proverbs of Solomon. The end. Thank you so much for listening. Have a wonderful week, and I'll see you next week.